Welcome, everyone. My name is Brent Iverson. I'm the Dean of the School of Undergraduate Studies, and it's my privilege and honor to oversee the University Lecture Series. I know that most of you, or maybe all of you, are now eligible to vote. I strongly encourage you to do so. In fact, you probably noticed the voter registration tables outside. They're going to be there after tonight's lectures as well. Before we start, I want to ask, who is currently registered to vote? All right. That is fantastic. That, that is fantastic. Being registered is not enough. You have to vote. It is your honor and responsibility as a citizen to cast votes in every presidential election, state election, and local election. Your voice matters, and your vote counts. OK, if you are unclear on whether you are registered or not, or you don't exactly know how, all you need to have is the last four digits of your social security number or your driver's license number. That's all you need. And I urge you to use the voter registration tables if you have not signed up yet. This election season has been confusing for many. Strong opinions, significant disagreements, wildly different styles, various charges on all sides. Many are not happy with some aspects of government right now. So tonight, we're going to try to take a step back. No rhetoric, no emotion. We are not going to tell you how to vote. That's up to you. Since this is your first election, I've asked three of UT's most distinguished faculty to help put this year's election into a broader perspective for you. Now, this is an all-star lineup. We have Dr. Mark Uptegrove from the LBJ School. Stand up, stand up. Thank you. <laughs> We have Bethany Albertson from the Government Department. And we have Professor Michael Stoff from the History Department. <laughs> They're here to provide their insights and context from the point of view of their respective disciplines in order to help you understand what this election is all about so you can make an informed vote. Now, we're trying something new. So during the presentations, please send any questions you have for the speakers to our Twitter account at well, the one you used for the trivia questions. By the way, we already know who the winners are, and we will post their names at the end um, for the trivia contest. After all three have spoken, I'll ask the panel the best questions that we get from you. Um, and so. Make sure you ask questions, and, and if you want to direct it to any of them, fine. If you want to direct them to the panel, that's fine as well. OK, now for our first speaker. Mark Uptegrove. He is the director of the LBJ Presidential Library. Mark has hosted the Civil Rights Summit of 2014, which featured Barack and Michelle Obama, George W. and Laura Bush, Bill Clinton, and Jimmy Carter. He also hosted the Vietnam War Summit in 2016, which included John Kerry and Henry Kissinger. He has conducted exclusive interviews with five US presidents. Mark. Thank you, Dr. Iverson. And uh, congratulations to you for being enrolled at the University of Texas. Hook them horns. The memory still burns bright. During the spring of 1979, in my junior year of high school, I ventured by bus with a group of my classmates from suburban Philadelphia to Washington, D.C. for a whirlwind three-day visit that included the standard sights and stops reflecting the splendor 
of the world's greatest power. But the highlight of the trip, not just for me, but for many of my peers, was meeting Peter Kostmeyer, the dynamic 31-year-old freshman congressman from our district, who spoke to us about the pressing issues of our day. A member of Congress, and he's meeting with us, we thought. Since that heady occasion, as Dr. Iverson suggested, I've had the privilege of meeting seven US presidents and interviewing five on multiple occasions. But I remember distinctly what a big deal it felt like as a 17-year-old to meet our congressman in the nation's capital. How many of you would like to meet your congressman? We'll get a charge out of that. <laughs> well, to say the least, and that abysmal show of hands is a reflection, many folks in your generation don't share my generation's esteemed, esteem rather for elected officials. A 2015 Harvard Institute politics poll found that the majority of millennials say they would choose to recall all members of Congress if it were possible. And a Harvard poll earlier this year revealed that 50% of young Americans agree with the statement, the politics of today are no longer able to meet the challenges our country is facing. I accept that. Frankly, there's a lot to be cynical about. Bipartisanship breeding incivility and legislative impotence. Members of both parties who put politics over country and ideology over pragmatic compromise. Vitriolic, divisive rhetoric in the media and strewn about social media. And after all, disdain for elected officials is nothing new. As Mark Twain wrote in the latter part of the 18th century, suppose you were an idiot and suppose you were a member of Congress, but I repeat myself. That kind of humor has been bread and butter for everybody from Mark Twain to John Oliver, Samantha Bee, and Kean Peel, and in many ways, it's healthy. But what I find troubling is that the millennial generation, you in this room perhaps, are generally repelled not only by the political landscape, but by the notion of getting involved in politics, either directly or indirectly. Young voters are less likely to go to the polls than older voters. In the last presidential election, 57% of registered voters nationally cast ballots compared to only 41% of those ages 18 to 24. Jennifer Lawless, an American University professor and author, says young people are interested in saving the world and care about making their communities a better place, but they don't consider electoral politics a way to achieve those goals. That generational shift concerns me, and that's what I want to talk to you about tonight. As my wife often says, nothing's going to change until something changes. And she's always right. Just ask her. <laughs> to accept politics as usual is to condone it. In this election season, which clearly signals that Americans are fed up, I hope that you especially, younger people with a distinct point of view, will see the changing tide as an opportunity to as Dr. Iverson said, make your voices heard. The ideas and convictions of millennials who recently overtook my generation, the baby boomers, as the nation's largest living generation should resound. And they will most resonate if members of your generation get in the game by voting, by volunteering for a campaign or a political cause, and eventually by actually running for office. I accept, too, that there's a lot to be cynical about in this presidential cycle. The Democratic and Republican candidates seem to be less than forthcoming. And each side continually accuses the other of lying, obfuscating, and bigotry, and other things. Let's face it, it's not a positive reflection of who we are as a nation. But I urge you, as Dr. Iverson did, on Election Day, to register your choice. Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump, 
or independent candidate Gary Johnson, or Green Party candidate Jill Stein, or write in a vote Charlie Strong, Kim Kardashian, Kanye West. Or Bill, the, Bill, Bill Nye, the science guy. If you really think they would be a good choice for president, write their names in on your ballot. Consider this. In the election of 2000, when most of you were in diapers, George W. Bush won the presidency over his Democratic challenger, Al Gore. But if just 537 votes in Florida, that's about half of this room, had cast their votes for Gore over Bush, Al Gore would have been the 43rd president. That shows you the fragility and the malleability of the electoral process and the power of a single vote. Make your voices heard. That's what an election is. It's a chorus of voices. Often it doesn't sound pretty. It can be discordant, off-key, or shrill. But the louder it is, the stronger we are. Winston Churchill said, democracy is the worst form of government, except all others. And Abraham Lincoln called American democracy the last best hope on earth. Don't lose sight of that one word, hope. Cynicism is a natural part of the human condition, but it is hope that sustains us. When you cast your vote, you, in essence, are bestowing the hope for a better tomorrow. And there's every reason that it will come. Remember this, if history tells us anything, it is that we as a country, over time, move ever forward. The arc of American progressivism, like the Dow Jones Index, goes through fickle whims, both bull and bear, but ultimately, we grow. We leap forward by yards, fall back by inches, and leap forward once more, eventually becoming, as is written in our Declaration of Independence, a more perfect union. Think about it. 150 years ago, the Civil War ended, and with it went the odious institution of slavery, banned constitutionally by the 13th Amendment. To the, uh, 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 13th Amendment. 55 years later, in 1920, women long denied the ballot were given the right to vote. Less than half a century forward came a complement of civil rights reform through the Civil Rights Act of 19. 64, breaking the back of Jim Crow, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and the Fair Housing Act of 1968. All of those things happened because we had a government that listened to its people and acted. To be sure, we have also had setbacks. African Americans went from slavery into decades of indentured servitude, bigotry, and systemic injustice. Women suffered discrimination and further decades of second-class citizenry and still don't receive comparable pay in the workplace. Voting rights are being challenged today, disproportionately affecting people of color and putting at risk the strides made a half a century ago. But we never go back completely to the way we were. How many Americans today believe that slavery should be reinstated or that women or people of color should be denied the right to vote, or that minorities shouldn't have the same access to public accommodations as whites. Though gay marriage was met with controversy when the Supreme Court upheld it in the summer of 2015, is there any doubt that half a century from now, Americans will look back at a time when gay and lesbian Americans were denied the, the right to marry as unimaginable? As Dr. Iverson mentioned, I am the director of the LBJ Presidential Library, which sits right across the street. And I hope you all visit at some point during your tenure as students. LBJ was our 36th president, succeeding John F. Kennedy 
after the latter's assassination in 1963. And Johnson served the balance of Kennedy's term before winning the presidency in his own right in 1964. Among his legislative triumphs were the passages of the Civil Rights Acts that I spoke about, working with Martin Luther King and other leaders to ensure that the laws that we have on our books deliver the long-held promise in our Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created or equal. LBJ considered the most important of his legislative reform to be the passage of the Voting Rights Act. The crown jewel of the LBJ Presidential Library are the 643 hours of taped conversations of LBJ doing the business of his presidency. My favorite of all those recordings is the conversation that LBJ has with Martin Luther King, which occurs on January 15, 1965, on what was Martin Luther King's 36th birthday. Both President and Johnson, both President Johnson and Dr. King desperately wanted a law that would guarantee that every American, black, brown, yellow, and white, had unrestricted access to the ballot. And they knew that the most important thing that they could do was put the, vow, the, the power of the vote in the hands of people of color because that would result in real change. Putting people in office who had their best interests as a constituency at heart. They also knew that they needed each other to get the Voting Rights Act passed. Johnson needed King in order to expose the American people to the very worst of voting oppression. And King needed Johnson to help the Voting Rights Act pass through a very reluctant United States Congress. Here is part of that conversation. Patty, can we roll the tape? You can uh, contribute a great deal by getting your leaders and you yourself taking very simple examples of uh, discrimination where a man's got to memorize a long fella whether he's got to quote the uh, the first uh, uh, ten amendments or he's got to uh, tell you what uh, amendment 15 16 17 is and then ask them if they know and show uh, what happens and uh, uh, some some people don't have to do that but when a negro comes in he's got to do it and if we can just repeat and repeat and repeat. If you can find the worst condition that you run into in Alabama, Mississippi, uh, or Louisiana, or South Carolina, where, uh, well, I think one of the worst I ever heard of is the president of the school at uh, Tuskegee, or the head of the government department there, or something, be being denied the right to cast a vote. And if you just take that one illustration, get it on radio, and get it on television, get it on uh, in the pulpits, get it in the, in the meetings, get it every place you can. Uh, pretty soon, the, the fellow that didn't do anything but follow, drive a tractor, he'll say, well, that's not right, that's not fair. And then that will help us on what we're going to shove through and in. And if we do that, we will break through as a... Uh, It'll be the greatest breakthrough of anything, not even except in this 64 Act. I think the greatest achievement of my administration, I think the greatest achievement in foreign policy, I said to a group yesterday, was the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. But I think this will be big. Isn't that a remarkable conversation? Two months later, after a horrific event in Selma, Alabama called Bloody Sunday, in which Alabama state troopers violently beat protesters. Johnson and King had the moral imperative they needed to pass the Voting Rights Act. As you heard, uh, President Johnson knew that if Dr. King exposed Americans to the oppression of voting rights, they would conclude that isn't right, that isn't fair. That's exactly what happened. Guided by the American people, some of whom put their lives on the line, Congress passed the Voting Rights Act. 
In so doing, they protected our most sacred trust, the right to make our voices heard, which I urge you tonight to exercise. Mahatma Gandhi once said, be the change you wish to see in the world. Our government is the essence of our democracy. With your vote, you have the power to change it. And as you know, as UT students, what starts here changes the world. Thank you. You know, I like this group. Not only did most of you already say that you're registered to vote, you gave a huge applause for Bill Nye the science guy. And this chemistry professor thinks that's pretty cool. The next person up is a true rock star. But professor Bethany Albertson's current research examines the effect of religious appeals in American politics and the relationship between emotion and cognition with a focus on the role of anxiety and attitudes toward immigration. Her book, Anxious Politics, Democratic Citizenship in a Threatening World, was selected as a co-winner of the Robert Lane Award, Award for the Best Book in Political Psychology, published in all of 2015. Bethany? Thank you. Well, it is such a thrill to be here and to have the chance to share some of my research with you. Um, you all are freshmen at UT, and if you're anything like I was as a freshman, the emotion of anxiety is pretty familiar to you, right? I probably don't have to go through, a lot of times when I give talks like this, I start by defining the emotion. This is uh, your heart beats faster, your palms sweat. It's this uncomfortable emotion of uncertainty, and you need it to get resolved, right? So this isn't an emotion, probably, that is pretty unfamiliar to you. Um, hopefully, you won't experience it too many times during your time at UT. Um, what I'm going to tell you about today is what happens when we're anxious about politics, something that I experience quite regularly. Um, I'm going to be showing you a couple studies from my book, Anxious Politics, Democratic Citizenship in a Threatening World. Um, this was co-authored with Shana kushner Gadarian. And let's start by noting, maybe, if you're not already anxious, there is no shortage of things out there to make you anxious, right? If you don't already carry with you your own anxieties about politics and public affairs, all you have to do is turn to a magazine, turn on cable news, open a newspaper, and there's no shortage of things that's gonna get your heart beating a little bit faster. Okay. This is interesting to us as political psychologists because there's this line of research in emotional intelligence, affective intelligence, showing that emotion is something that can aid us in our decision making. What Shana and I wanted to do was look at the role of emotion in decision making and examine its nuances. In particular, because though there are many things out there in the world that might make us anxious, There are also plenty of politicians who see it in their interest to scare us. Some of our most famous political ads have been those designed around inducing states of anxiety. What's more is, uh, so the Willie Horton ad, the Daisy ad, if you ever take one of my classes, we're gonna go through these all. Um, the bear, that was Reagan. Um, beyond that, right, beyond uh, politicians trying to make us anxious, trying to scare up votes, presumably, um, there have been public health campaigns um, designed to keep us safe, but in order to keep us safe, they think they have to induce a little bit of fear. And so what Shane and I were interested in is what happens to citizens under conditions of anxiety. Today I'm going to show you some of my work on anxiety and political trust. We think that anxious citizens need to seek out protection. 
One of the ways we do this in politics is by putting our trust in political figures. We argue that anxious people will become more trusting of politicians and political figures conditional upon two things. One, the expertise of the actor. So we argue that anxious people don't trust indiscriminately, that their trust is confined to people with expertise. And two, and this is interesting, I think, when the subject of anxiety is politicized, then partisan politics can play a really important role. And we argue that when it comes to a framed threat, something that we debate about, whether it's something to be afraid of or not, that perhaps the party that owns the issue may be the beneficiary. So I'm going to show you two studies, one on a public health threat, one on immigration, and then I'm going to speculate wildly on the 2016 election. I know. And I think this is being filmed. OK, so here's, oops, let's go back one. Here's study one. OK, so you might be wondering, how do you study anxiety as a political psychologist? Um, we experiment on people. So experimentation, not just for the hard sciences, right? Here's how we do it. Um, in this study, we have people read a newspaper story. Um, we've mocked it up and invented things. In this study, you're reading about either a smallpox outbreak in Cleveland, Ohio that happened 25 years ago or is happening right now, right? Because we want both conditions thinking about the smallpox outbreak and only the treatment condition particularly anxious. We also debrief people, if that's a concern to you. Happy to talk about that later. OK. What we find is that, OK, this is how much you trust all these different people, the doctors, CDC, friends and family in the medical field, um, all the way down. Uh, Oprah's there because this is a thing when you're a, a researcher, you get to design your own studies. And Oprah has this public health thing that I think is kind of interesting and potentially problematic. So I threw in my study. Um, as you can see, not that trusted when it comes to a smallpox outbreak. What you're seeing there is the difference between treatment and control. Who trusts in each of these figures a great deal? And there's a couple important things to take note of. We as an American public seem to make some sense, right? We put most trust in doctors, CDC, people in the medical field less trust in the Federal Reserve Board. Makes sense, the IRS. And what's particularly hopeful to Shana and I about these findings is that under conditions of anxiety, we have an increase in trust in those organizations that are relevant to the source of the threat. This was a hopeful finding for us, right? It could be that when citizens are anxious, they just trust willy-nilly. They just throw their trust in everyone. What we found was that anxious citizens put their trust in relevant figures. But this is a public health threat. So you might be thinking, well, yeah, you have your hopeful finding there. But public health is relatively removed from partisan politics. And so maybe that's an area in which we would see anxiety leading us to trust in experts. What about? something more politicized, like the debate over immigration. OK, here's a different type of anxiety manipulation that we use in our research. And this one's based on political advertisements. If you've ever wondered how a political advertisement induces an emotional response, um, I'm going to give you some clues here. So this ad was based on a Pete Wilson ad, um, who was a governor in California at, when I was growing up. Um, and I think what you'll find is the ad resonates still today. Let's play the treatment condition first. It's how most of us got here. It's how this country is built. American citizenship is a national treasure. But now, rules are being broken. Today, more than 11 million illegal immigrants overwhelm our borders and our hospitals. Illegal immigrants take American jobs. Open borders bring crime and a threat to national security. Illegal immigrants take welfare, health care, and education dollars that should go to hardworking Americans. 
there is a right way to do things and a wrong way. Enough is enough. Say no to illegal immigration. OK, so that's the threatening ad. Um, what we did was we took the old Pete Wilson ad, and we took it apart. We did the music, the voiceover, and we brought our own images in, but they represent basically what the original ad looked like. Now, how do you make a less anxiety-inducing version of the same ad? Well, it's hard, but here's what we did. It's how most of us got here. It's how this country was built. American citizenship is a national treasure, but now rules are being broken. Today, more than 11 million illegal immigrants overwhelm our borders and our hospitals. Illegal immigrants take American jobs. Open borders bring crime and a threat to national security. Illegal immigrants take welfare, health care, and education dollars that should go to hardworking Americans. There is a right way to do things and a wrong way. Enough is enough. Say no to illegal immigration. So if you are really, really smart and really, really creative, I want you to work on experiments in the social sciences. Because for us, it's really hard to isolate our independent variables, right? Uh, there's no placebo. There's no pill we can use. Here, I wanted to just manipulate the emotional experience of anxiety and hold thinking about immigration constant. And hopefully what you saw is that those two ads were completely the same, same voiceover, everything, except for two things, the music and the visuals, right? That's all we changed between the two ads. And what we found, asking people to rate their trust in a variety of political figures, Obama, the political parties, citizen groups like the Minutemen, Arizona Governor Jan Brewer, US Custom and Border Control, What I'm showing you here is differences between the treatment and control condition. So that lines on the right side are a boost in trust, and lines on the left side are a decrease in trust. And we've separated out respondents by whether they identify as Republican or Democrat. For Republicans, what you see is that being in the treatment condition, compared to being in the control, are less trusting of the president, are less trusting of the Democratic Party, and are more trusting of the Republican Party. What's really interesting about this experiment to us is that Democrats become more trusting of the Republican Party in the treatment condition. We attribute this to the fact that historically the Republican Party has owned the issue of immigration. Right? We don't think about this very often, but sometimes parties have long-standing advantages on political issues, as the Republican Party does on immigration. And so under conditions of anxiety, that party that owns the issue is going to benefit, even among Democrats in this case. OK, so we've talked about issue ownership and expertise as factors that can affect who we trust under conditions of threat. And we've done this with public health threats, and we've done this with immigration. And now I'm going to speculate wildly. <laughs> oh, I can get myself in trouble here. Let's try not to. Like a good social scientist, I am going to give you evidence on both sides. And I'm going to couch it a whole lot. What is anxiety going to do to the electorate for the 2016 election? Because this is an anxious time. If you're not anxious about this election, I would think you haven't read about it yet. Seriously, read about it. Read about it. OK. OK, here you go. So among Democrats, this is how worried are you about a major terror attack in the United States? Um, and it ranges from not very worried to extremely worried. And you could see for Democrats, not really big differences. They like Clinton. Yeah, not surprising. Republicans, they like Trump. There's a little bit of difference. They become a little more trusting or um, have more positive feelings towards Trump as uh, they become more anxious about a terror attack. 
But what's really interesting are those 205 independents in the survey. What you see among those independents is that the more worried they are about a terrorist attack, the more likely they are to like Trump. So clearly, right, I'm telling you, anxiety about terrorism, which we have, is going to play to Trump's advantage going to 2016, right? OK, I don't think so. I don't think so. Here's why. I'm an experimentalist. This is survey data, meaning these people weren't experimentally made anxious. They just are, or they're not, right? So with those independents, what we don't know there, are they liking Trump more because they feel anxious? Or are they feeling anxious because they like Trump more? <laughs> it could be that anxiety is making voters like Trump more. It could be voters that like Trump more are listening to him a lot and becoming more anxious about terrorism. Oh my goodness. This is why I like experiments. Causality is much easier. OK, last thing I'll show you, and this is to toy with the idea, because a very conventional explanation of the last data I just showed you is that, well, traditionally, Republican Party has owned terrorism. Therefore, anxiety about terrorism is going to play to the Republicans' advantage. Right? And I could tell you that very confidently and sit down, walk away, um, and I'd be in good company. But I want to give you a little bit of reason to doubt that. Trump is an interesting candidate for sure. Um, he is not a typical Republican candidate, right, in that he doesn't have a lot of the Republican establishment behind him, and in particular, the Republican foreign policy establishment behind him. So it's possible that though his party owns the issue of terrorism, it's possible that he's not going to benefit from that. And on that note, what I'm showing you here is polling data at three different time periods. Who do you trust to handle terrorism? Uh, and Americans appear to be trusting Clinton more than Trump. So what I've tried to give you is evidence on both sides. If you asked me, which candidate I think benefits more from anxiety around terrorism? Like a good social scientist, I'm going to tell you my answer and hope you remember it if I end up being right and hope you forget this ever happened if I end up being wrong. But I think Clinton benefits. OK. Thank you. In many ways, our last speaker tonight needs no introduction. He's one of the individuals on the faculty at the University of Texas at Austin that I look up to as much as anybody I know here. Since joining the UT faculty in 1979, Michael Stoff has directed the honors and graduate programs in the Department of History. He's taught courses for the Normandy Scholars Program on World War II. And if you don't know what that is, I strongly recommend you look into it. It's life changing. He's been honor honored almost a dozen times for his teaching, most recently with the UT System Wide Regents Outstanding Teaching Award. He is a director of the esteemed Plan 2 Honors Program. Pause for applause. which, as you know, is one of the most innovative, successful, and most copied honors programs in the United States. Michael. Thank you, Brent, for that uh, very generous introduction. I almost didn't recognize myself. <laughs> I don't know about the rest of you, but I am suffering from a very serious case of PCF. Do you know PCF? It's called Presidential Campaign Fatigue. <laughs> this year's presidential campaign season uh, has stretched on for much longer than one season, uh, for more than a year, and still, it's not over. 
What used to signal the kickoff of a presidential campaign, Labor Day, well now, now it kicks off the home stretch, which means that most of, most of the campaign is behind us. Uh, the, the race uh, has a little bit to go yet. For some, this race has been going on for years. Fill in Hillary Clinton here. Still, however fatigued we are, we must pay attention. And we must pay close attention to this particular election. And we do so for, for a very important reason. Not just this election, but every presidential election. And that is that the presidency is the most important office in the land. Arguably, it's the most important office in the world. And it's our democratic right, our democratic responsibility to cast our votes and to do so in full awareness of the issues and of the candidates. And frankly, it ain't easy. The political chatter is unending. The political spinning is dizzying. And the claims and counterclaims come in a torrent with little opportunity for us to think deeply about them or even to check their veracity. And all of this is duplicated, amplified, played and replayed relentlessly in a 24-hour news cycle and a second-by-second -second cycle on social media. Still, difficult as it is, we must pay attention, especially this year. The election of 2016, the first one in which many of you will vote, all of you, I hope, will vote, uh, could be one of the most important in the history of the United States. Political scientists tell us that, that some presidential elections are more important than others. They call these elections critical elections, and they are political earthquakes. They reshape the political landscape profoundly, creating new alliances and, and new alignments that shape politics for decades to come. The election of 1800, the election of 1824, the election of 1860, the election of 1896, the election of 1932, and the election of 1980, which brought Ronald Reagan to the White House. These are all critical shaping elections. And each case, in each case, the vast political realignment that occurred either cemented the dominance of one party over another, or it created, less often, a new party system, sometimes new parties. Will this be such an election? Surely, there's a lot hanging in the balance. Will the Democrats continue to dominate the White House? For all but eight years of the last 24, a Democrat has been in the White House. Will the coalition that elected Barack Obama, a coalition of young people, so-called minorities, labor, and the middle class, will, will that coalition hold and help to remake the Democratic Party? Will Republicans continue to control both houses of Congress as they have for the last six years? Will the modern Republican Party even survive? This may be a moment, like 1860, when the demise of one party, the old Whigs, leads to the creation of a new party, the Republican Party, born in the 1850s and put into the White House in 1860. Or in our case, will a new political realignment in which both parties change dramatically occur, one that produces a system that's less middling, less centrist, and more extreme? with a right-wing Ted Cruz-like Republican Party and a left-wing Bernie Sanders Democratic Party? Will the presidency as we know it survive? At least one candidate has promised to pursue some paths, torture, for example, that could provoke a constitutional crisis that would end up cutting at the heart of executive power and authority. So, 
there's a lot riding on this election. How are we to decide with whom to cast our ballots, with whom to cast our lots? How can we assess a candidate's worthiness, test the mettle of a candidate for a job that is utterly unique, a job for which no career, no profession adequately prepares one, not the military, not politics, not even business. What constitutes presidential leadership, in other words? And let's not stop there. Let's reach for the skies. What constitutes presidential greatness? So let's begin with the office of the presidency itself. And let's start by saying that all in all, it's a hell of a job. We have no office quite like it. It, along with the vice presidency, are the only national offices we have. And those who seek and win the presidency must be broadly representative of the American people, even though every single candidate, by and large, begins at the local level. How do they transform themselves into a, into a national candidate? Even more difficult than this is something that's modern. The presidency has become a hybrid office, one that combines functions separated in other systems of government and, and frankly, originally intended to be separate in our system of government. The founders wanted a presidency that was rather weak and, and ceremonial. An executive meant largely to execute the will of the legislature, the will of Congress, but over the years, the line between ceremony and governance, legislation, has blurred. Now presidents come to office. We don't just expect these presidents to be, be ceremonial leaders. We expect them to govern. We expect them to have legislative agendas. And we hold them accountable when they don't achieve those legislative agendas made in the course of their campaigns as campaign promises. So now we've created a hybrid office, one with a ceremonial function and a governance function. Now, that sounds familiar to us. We, we expect both those things, but think about it for a moment. Think about these jobs. Each one of them is extremely difficult, really tough, but together, they form a nearly impossible juggling act. Why? Well, because they require of one person two sets of traits, two skills that are almost diametrically opposed. Ceremony. Ceremony requires a generous and merciful spirit. The ability to embody and speak to our higher selves, our, our better angels, as Lincoln called it. Ceremony requires a vision, a story about the future, but a noble story, a story of noble purpose. It requires the ability to see beyond the horizon, to see the big picture, and tell a story about that future that is both resonant and realistic. Ceremony requires a dignity in office, a humility in office, and a focus on those big ends. Where do we want to go? Who do we want to be? Governance, on the other hand, requires toughness, sometimes ruthlessness. It requires an eye for detail, sometimes with a laser-like intensity. It requires a focus on means. How do we get things done? And the ability to twist arms when needed. The British, very wisely, it seems to me, separated those two functions. They have a king or a queen for ceremony. They have a prime minister for governance. But we did not separate them. The result is that among the 40-plus men, all our presidents, as you well know, have been men, among the 40-plus men who have held that job, historians have designated only three as great. It is, as I say, a hell of a job. How then do we assess those who have held it? And more important for us tonight, well, how can we judge who's best qualified for this office? Especially when we have two candidates 
who have absolutely no experience in the job of being president. And one candidate with no history of public service at all. How can we assess presidential leadership, the conundrum, the dilemma of presidential leadership, better still of presidential greatness, before the fact? Can we see it beforehand? Or can we see it at all? Or is it like Mr. Justice Potter Stewart once said of pornography in trying to define it? You know it when you see it. One place to start is with a simple question. What do the experts say about the qualities that, that produce presidential leadership and even presidential greatness? Well, let's begin with the great historian, Arthur Schlesinger Sr., who conducted the first presidential ranking poll among historians back in 1948. I'll bet you know who finished in the top three, the only three to be rated great. You know their names. Anybody? Washington, absolutely, more. Lincoln, and? Ah, uh, you're falling down here. No, not Reagan, and not LBJ, I'm sorry to say, Mark. Um, uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt. Franklin D. Roosevelt. You should give somebody a, a, a prize for that. Franklin D. Roosevelt. And what did, what did Schlesinger say were the key traits of these great ones? One, ambition for power. Ambition for power. Ambition, said Lincoln's law partner of Lincoln himself, was the little engine that drove him. Second, effective use of power, particularly in leaving the presidency stronger and more influential. Over the years, we've asked more of our presidents than simply an ambition for and an effectiveness with power. The great ones, experts tell us, take risks. The great ones, experts tell us, provoke controversy. The great ones, experts tell us, stand in the bully pulpit of the presidency, preach to the nation, frame the great issues of the day, and offer solutions, ones that are both achievable and healthy. Political scientists tell us that great presidents are conservative revolutionaries. Sounds oxymoronic, doesn't it? Conservative revolutionary. They educate us about the need for change. But they also show us how to accommodate change, how to achieve change within the boundaries of constitutional law and political feasibility. And in the modern era, psychologists tell us that great presidents have also shown high emotional intelligence, high EI, which means that the great ones have the ability to stay in control of their emotions and make those emotions serve constructive purposes. Here, as you might suspect, Richard Nixon, Bill Clinton, they rank low in emotional intelligence. Franklin Roosevelt, Abraham Lincoln, they rank high. And here, too, is where measurable numbers come into play. There actually is a scale for measuring emotional intelligence. So how do we assess presidential leadership and the potential for presidential leadership? Are there other things we can measure? Well, how about size? Size matters, as Donald Trump has told us. <laughs> uh, but here I mean height, height, height. Sociologists tell us that height matters. Tall people tend to move up the socioeconomic ladder faster than non-tall people. Turns out, by the way, that all three of the greatest presidents were over six feet tall. And the tallest, Lincoln, 6'4", was also the greatest of them all. So height may help. But it's important to realize that it doesn't always help. Warren Harding was six feet tall, and he was a disaster. <laughs> Chet Arthur, also six feet tall. And, and, and the guy who ranks lowest among all presidents, James Buchanan, also six feet tall. So size may not matter. How about education? That should matter. Well, Washington and Lincoln never attended college. And neither did two near-great presidents, Harry Truman, 
and Andrew Jackson. How about honesty? Well, it turns out FDR, Franklin Roosevelt, was among the most devious of all presidents and sometimes celebrated for it. How about age, maturity? The average age of the first nine presidents, 54 years old. Donald Trump is 70, Hillary Clinton will be 69 in October. What about maturity? While the French ambassador used to say that Theodore Roosevelt, another near great, acted like an 11-year-old suffering from arrested development. <laughs> but there are two things the great ones did share. Two things, as it turns out, that, that are impossible to quantify, as many important things are. The first is the ability to connect on an elemental level with those they governed, to grasp the hopes and the ambitions of the American people, to calm the fears of the American people, to soothe the anxieties of the American people. The ability to understand what it's, what it's like to be another. We call this empathy, empathy. The great ones all had it. A second thing is something we've heard a great deal about these days, temperament. Temperament matters. Mr. Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes once described Franklin Roosevelt in this way, second-rate intellect, first-rate temperament. But what exactly is temperament? Everybody talks about it, but nobody tells us what exactly it is. Well, temperament comes from the Latin, temperamenturum. And it literally means the correct mix, the correct mix. And that's what we're looking for, the correct mix. But what is that? Well, I've studied the presidency for a long time. And, and so let me tell you what I think the correct mix is. Enough passion to produce a large following. Enough authenticity to promote trust. Enough reason to avoid demagoguery, speaking to people's emotions rather than their intellects. Enough toughness to stand the toughest test and to do so with calmness. Enough empathy to breed mercy. Enough confidence to understand that you do not know everything. Enough curiosity to learn what you do not know. Enough ambition, like Lincoln, to win the race. But enough wisdom to understand that you must transform ambition for the one into ambition for the many. It's a difficult mix to get just right. But we can if we know what we're looking for. And I hope now, after this too long talk, that you do. Thank you very much. Thank you. I want to thank all of our speakers again for a wonderful set of talks tonight. We have a number of questions uh, that came from you, and they're not addressed to anyone in particular, so anyone who wants to answer, um, go ahead. So the first question, in the face of the disapproval of the major party's candidates, do you think this is the election for third parties to shine? No. 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 Next, next question. No. <laughs> I, I, I think third parties have always traditionally have been, uh, had a difficult time. Uh, and I don't see anything in this election cycle that, that would speak to a sudden change in that. But I do see, as I, uh, as I was saying, that there is a possibility to realign existing parties. I, I'm total agreement. <laughs> okay. Should the president or the Congress make election day a national holiday so everyone has the chance to vote or maybe change voting hours? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And uh, the idea of float, because I can't get it done myself, but whenever I have a crowd of people, I, I throw this idea out there, because maybe one of you can make it happen. Uh, let's merge, because I think there's some concern about having another holiday. Um, so let's merge Election Day and Veterans Day. Done. 
But, but frankly, holidays are when we celebrate things. Uh, and what makes us unique is that we are a democracy. We're the first democracy in the world. Frankly, our franchise as American citizens, that's worth something to celebrate. That's, that's something we should be celebrating. Uh, I'm in favor, personally, of anything that makes voting easier, not more difficult. Uh, the, the easier it is, the more people, I think, will, will participate. The fewer obstacles there are, the more people will participate. And, and having to work all, all day long and somehow find a minute here and a minute there to, to, to vote is, frankly, an obstacle. So I'm all in favor of uh, whatever you call it, uh, giving people the day off on, on election day. But, too, the, the, there is, there's now... Uh, we're seeing many states allow you to vote early. Uh, online voting is more prevalent. There are ways of allowing people to vote even if they don't get out on election day. You all can vote as absentee voters as well if you're worried about showing up on, on election day. So that shouldn't be an impediment in my view. And, and there's an early voting venue right here on campus over yeah. in the old uh, undergraduate library. What's it now called, Brent? It's right next to your building. The FAC. <laughs> Say it loud. The Vaughan Academic Center. Why are you laughing? <laughs> I got it right. <laughs> All right. Do you think it takes an unconventional or unfortunate condition in order for a president to show their full potential? Great crises make great presidents, unfortunately. Uh, Bill Clinton, I think, was as ambitious as any president. And he had the misfortune, if you want to be a great president, of being in the White House between the fall of the, of the Berlin Wall and the fall of the Twin Towers. It was a relatively tranquil period in our nation's history. And unfortunately, the great presidents are tested by fire, these crucibles. Uh, John, uh, you know, Washington, who... who uh, Michael mentioned uh, the first president. He's, he's essentially defining the job of, of president. Lincoln, of course, had the Civil War, and Franklin Roosevelt had two trials, the, the Great Depression, the worst economic crisis, crisis in our history, and the Second World War. These are great, great tests, and these men met those tests. That's what made them great presidents. Theodore Roosevelt always used to say um, that he was a great president only no one recognized it, uh, and, and he never had the opportunity to show it. Uh, and, and I agree with Mark that, that, that Roosevelt used to say, presidential greatness requires the man and the moment. And, and if you look at all three of those, those great presidents, well, they are showing their stuff not just at moments of crisis, but moments of existential crisis for the United States. Washington, the founding of, of, of the Republic. Lincoln, uh, that moment when, when democracy, when the Republic failed. The, the Republic is about, uh, ought to be about, peaceable solutions to common problems. But democracy and the Republic failed in 1860. Uh, and, and Lincoln helped to knit the country back together again. Franklin Roosevelt, as Mark said, had two crises. I often wonder, what would have happened? How would we rate Roosevelt if he'd only had one, if he'd only <laughs> faced the Great Depression. Let's be clear, Roosevelt did lots of things, but he never solved the riddle of recovery. Uh, the United States was still mired in depression at the end of his second term. He decided to run for a third and then a fourth, and the Second World War, of course, came along. Uh, and the result was these two great crises, in some ways existential crises, again, tested his, his mettle and, and showed presidential greatness. I agree, Mark. OK. I want to thank everybody for attending. There were almost 1,900 of you here tonight. And I want to applaud you for that. I want to remind you that the voter registration tables are going to be available after tonight's presentation. And I want those five people to come up, and we will give you your prizes. Let's thank everybody one more time. <laughs>